that is our library introduction. I am now gonna move on to the amazing Kwe Mai. So we are fortunate that we were able to get the Mountains Sing as our on the same page for APIA. On the same page is a, a monthly read, bi-monthly read um, that SFPL participates and we try to get our community to read the entire book, in the entire community to read the same book. So thank you for doing that and thank you for participating. Um, the book um, is an epic multi-generational tale uh, set in Vietnam during the backdrop of the Vietnam War. Um, lots of land reform and communist government rose in the north. Uh, it's really Huang, the story of Huang who comes to age as her parents and uncles head off down the Ho Chi Minh Trail to fight a conflict that tore not just the beloved country, but her family apart. Kwe Mai is a Vietnamese poet and author who has written eight books. This is her first novel in English. Kwe Mai is one of the few authors bringing Vietnamese, Vietnamese literature to a wider English speaking audience. The story is in like, unlike any I have read, a powerful look into a side of the Vietnam War those of us educated in the Western West have never heard. Um, Kwe Mai was born, in, born into the Vietnam War in 1973. She grew up witnessing war's devastation and its aftermath. She worked as a street seller, rice farmer, before and rice farmer before winning a scholarship to attend university in Australia. Her writing has been translated and published in more than 10 countries, most recently in Norton's Inheriting the War Anthology. For more information, you can visit her website and that will be in the link. Um, Hoopla also has uh, Kwe Mai's poetry book available too and that's also in the link in the, that will be in the document. So now I would like to introduce Kwe Mai, everybody. Virtual claps, woo. Thank you so much, Anissa, for this wonderful introduction and thank you too. Alisa, for being, you know, the, the co-panel of today. Um, I have, I'm seeing 90 people to, uh, in uh, today's discussion and I'm so, so moved and so honored. Thank you so much for, you know, sharing your precious um, holiday, um, weekend time with me and with my book, The Mountain Sing. So actually I'm thrilled to be, you know, hosted by the San Francisco Public Library libraries changed my life actually when i was a little girl i always wanted to be a writer but i was told not to become a writer so i listened to my family and i had to do so many things to survive and to you know life took me on different journeys and i only returned to my writing dream when i got a job at a library library of the international uh, the american international school in dhaka bangladesh and i was responsible for ordering books for the library so you can guess what i did i ordered all the vietnamese authors <laughs> you know i wanted to increase the the collection about vietnam vietnamese literature in the book in in the library but i also wanted to read authors that i did not have a chance to read when i was in vietnam for example you know authors who who live outside vietnam or authors like zoom to hương who work was not available in vietnam anymore so yeah i i love to be you know um in the library and i'm so honored to be hosted today and i i want to acknowledge quite a few vietnamese people who are in 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 the uh, in the discussion today i see some names vietnamese name quỳnh xin chào cảm ơn mọi người rất nhiều cảm ơn mọi người đã chia sẻ thời gian ngày thứ bảy hôm nay với tôi thank you so much for being here this saturday thank you <laughs> so should i read a little bit of the book I think that sounds great, Kwe Mai. I think let's start there. How about an excerpt from the book and then we can move into a few questions that the audience might have? Yes. All right, so, I'm, I'm muting myself. Uh, so we have a lot of time today, so feel free to ask me questions about the book. Um, so um, I wrote this book um, 
with the with uh, with the wish to have a grandmother because both of my grandmothers had died before I was born. So I wanted, you know, our family doesn't even have a picture of my grandma. So I wanted to imagine how it was for them and what they what they went through, and uh, you know, I wanted to imagine their faces and hear them speak to me. And growing up, I was so jealous of my friends who had grandmothers to tell them stories because Vietnam has a very strong uh, storytelling traditions. And this is the very, the, the tradition that helps us survive through, through our long history of foreign domination, colonization, um, and of many war and conflict. So I wanted to hang on and treasure this kind of storytelling heritage by writing this book. And in this, inside this, when I wrote this book, it took me seven years. I found the grandmother I wanted to have and um, her name is Grandma Ziu Lan. So I'm going to read to you um, a little bit of her voice. And um, you know, the book is also told uh, in the voice of Hương, her, her granddaughter. And she, uh, Hương is nicknamed Guava because um, Hương means fragrance, which would be uh, attractive, uh, attracting evil spirits. So um, according to the Vietnamese traditions, we call young children, you know, very ugly names so as to not to attract, uh, you know, the spirits which are believed to hover above the earth and looking for beautiful children to kidnap. So, um, so um, this, this is the first part that uh, the reader hears the voice of Grandma Ziu Lan. The fortune teller, Nghệ An province, 1930-1942. Whoever remember how we used to wander around the old quarter of Hanoi. We often stopped in front of a house on Hangai I didn't know anyone who lived there on Silk Street, but we stood in front of the house, peering through its gate. Remember how beautiful everything was? Wooden doors featured exquisite carvings of flowers and birds, lacquered shutters gleamed under the sun, and ceramic dragons soared atop the roof's curving edges. The house was a traditional namzan with five wooden sections, remember? And there was a front yard paved with red bricks. Now I can tell you the reason I lingered in front of that house. It looks just like my childhood home in Nghệ An. As I stood there with you, I could almost hear the happy chatter of my parents, my brother Gong and Auntie Tu. Ah, you asked me why I never mentioned to you about having a brother and an aunt. I'll tell you about them soon, but don't you want to visit my childhood room, home first? To go there, you and I will need to travel 300 kilometers from Hanoi. We follow the national highway, passing Nam Ninh, Ning Bing, and Thanh Hoa provinces. Then we turn left at a pagoda called Phu Ding crossing several communes before arriving at Vĩnh Phúc, a village in the north of Vietnam. The name of this village is special Guava, as it means forever blessed. At Vĩnh Phúc, anyone will gladly show you to the gate of our ancestors' home, the Chan family's house. They walk you along the village road, passing a pagoda with the ends of its roof curving like the fingers of a splendid dancer, passing ponds where children and buffaloes splash around. During summer, you gaps at clouds of purple flowers blooming on swan tree and at red gout flowers sailing through the air like burning boats. During the rice harvest season, the village row will spread out its golden carpet of straws to welcome you. In the middle of the village, you arrive in front of a large estate surrounded by a garden filled with fruit trees. Picking through the gate, you see a house similar to the one we saw on Silk Street, only more charming and much larger. 
The people who take you there will ask whether you related, whether you are related to the Chan family. If you tell them the truth, whoever, they'll be astonished. The Chan family members have either died, been killed, or disappeared. You learn that seven families have occupied this building since 1955. None of them are relatives. My beloved granddaughter, don't look so shocked. Do you understand why I have decided to tell you about our family? If our stories survive, we will not die even when our bodies are no longer here on this earth. The John family's house is where I was born, got married, and gave birth to your mother Ngoc, your uncles Da Thuận Sang, and your aunt Hang. You didn't know this, but I have another son, Ming. He's my firstborn, and I love him very, very much. But I don't know whether he's dead or alive. He was taken away from me 17 years ago, and I haven't seen him since. So this is uh, the opening of Grandma uh, Ziu Lan's voice. Um, she is to tell Huang and the reader about her family and the history of Vietnam before 1972, and Huang will continue the storytelling tradition by telling, by uh, recounting her experiences after 1972. So together, the two women uh, weave, you know, the history of Vietnam into the history of their family to make up the mountain scene. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kwe Mai. So we do have a couple questions already. Would you like to, to go there? Yes. Oh, Quynh just said, giọng chị hay quá nhịp nhàng như tiếng đàn. She said, your voice so beautiful, um, lyrical, like music. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's the part of I love about Vietnamese language. You know, our language is very lyrical. So I, um, I use a lot of Vietnamese language inside, in, inside the book. And I'm really thankful to readers who appreciate the Vietnamese culture by, by reading this book, you know, because all of our language is with full tonal mark. And I just want to tell you how proud I am that my name is written in full tonal mark. So at first, when I had this, I had a um, publishing contract. I um, I was thinking whether to leave the tonal marks out of my name. It would make it much more memorable for the for the international reader, right? They would remember how 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 my name is spelled or how to say my name. I would be able to sell more books. But then I told I. I told myself, no, you know, um, I want to preserve the Vietnamese culture through this book. I want to present you uh, Vietnam with its full color, full complexity, uh, you know, so I want, so I, I insisted to my publisher to keep the full tonal marks of all the Vietnamese language in this book. And I'm really thankful for their support. And Algonquin Books has done such an amazing job. Okay, so I'm ready to, to take your, your questions. Thank you. Um, I, I'm glad you brought up the, the lyrical nature of your, your language and the book, but I think your poetry also comes through as part of the lyricalness of, of how you write. So I think mm -hmm. that's also you know, important to, to let people know that you're also just an amazing poet as well. And that comes through as well. So. I will ask a couple questions and you can can just jump in. Um, do you have plans for a new novel coming up? Oh, thank you for the question. So actually, I sent my second novel to my agent and Ooh. she's reading it. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited. The second novel is based in the south of Vietnam. You know, I, I grew up in, in North Vietnam and as, as well as South Vietnam. And I couldn't have written this book, you know, without experiencing the, the, the Vietnam in different regions. So I have, I based the first book in North Vietnam. So I wanted to be fair to South Vietnam, which I love very much. So my second book is based in the South of Vietnam and it's um, more of a recent story 
of also you know of, of people struggle to overcome the aftermath of war so i'm really excited about this book and my agent is is, is loving it she told me i have an excellent agent julie stevenson and you know she because um i i must tell you that I, I wrote this book in the second language, right? And during the years that I wrote the book, I said, how am I going to sell this? Who's going to read this? And you know, I needed um, a champion because like for a um, minority writer who writes in the second language, who comes from a faraway country, I mean, you know, the person has to take a big chance. And uh, Julie was by my side from the beginning and I'm, I'm just so grateful. And you know, normally when, when books are published, people always, you know, attribute all the grace to the writers, but actually there's so much, so many people are behind this book. And I want to thank my, my, my editor, Bessie Glyke at the Algonquin Books. You know, she really believed in the book in the beginning as well. And, and this gives me hope for literature. And I hope to have more voices from around the world, you know. And with, with my novel's publication, I want to help more writers from Vietnam to be published internationally. Now I know how to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Quy Mai, do you, um, do you remember a defining moment when you wanted to become a writer? Um, I think I wanted to become a writer when I fell in love with books. Um, so um, I was six years old when I was uprooted from my small village in the north of Vietnam and planted again in the South Garden of South Vietnam. And that garden rejected me in the beginning because I was a stranger. I had different accents and I had come from, you know, uh, the north. And uh, the North and the South had been separated by the war for, for, for 20 years. And, you know, people were fighting against each other. So no wonder I was not accepted. But I was very confused. I was very sad. And I found my peace in books. And one of the books I really loved was 1001 Nights. <laughs> I loved that book. And I read it and I was like, wow, this is the power of storytelling. You know, stories can really... Uh, change our life and change our other people. And I, I, the more I read, the more I loved words. And I started to keep a diary. I, I wrote, I wrote every day. Uh, you know the stories I, that I was witnessing. And actually, I wanted to be a writer. And I told my family, and they said, No, no, no. Uh, you know, no, you should not become a writer. And my my two brothers told me, Don't you see how poor we are? You know, we don't even have enough to eat. If you become a writer, you will be starved. You know, do something useful with your life. So guess what I did. I went on to study business. <laughs> yes. And I worked in business for quite a while. And, um, and actually, I was one of the first investors of the Vietnamese stock market. Um, you know, but, you know, when I moved to Bangladesh with my husband because of his job, then I got to work in the international um, uh, in, in the library of the American International School of, of Dhaka. And I found my dream again. I was a fish being, being returned to its pond. I was swimming and I was like, I, I thought this is my place, you know, among the beauty of words. And, but I just read at that time, I think during those years, I made up for all the years that I was into business by reading, reading. I read authors from all around the world with a focus on authors who had who, who had written in Vietnamese. So then um, I, uh, so I read and I absorbed a lot of that love for literature, but I only started writing in 2006 when we returned to Vietnam. Um, and I want to tell you why, because being, you know, I had, uh, before that I, I lived in, I lived and worked in, uh, I studied and worked in Australia and then Bangladesh. And I, I'm so homesick. You know, and so um, I was very homesick and the joy of being back to Hanoi was, was fantastic. So I remember I used to ride on motorbikes to work. 
And at that time, you know, I mean, the joy of riding the motorbike and the scooter, you know, I had a, a scooter and I was thinking, and you put the wind in my hair and you know with the trees so i was writing poetry in my head and guess what happened the police didn't like it <laughs> because i could often um forget how to blink when i turn right for example i was fine so many times i mean Writing poetry is a very expensive hobby, you know, expensive thing to do. It costs money and it doesn't bring you much money. Just kidding. It brings a lot more. Um, but uh, yeah, so I started writing poetry first in Hanoi. Yes. So when my poetry was known, so publishers in Vietnam contacted me and said, oh, why don't you write prose? So then I started to write, you know, um, travel travel books and also, you know, short fiction. But I never thought I would write a novel until the year 2012 when I penned The Mountain Sing. That's amazing, Kwemai, that you just started writing in 2006. I mean, that's like, you're, you're a fresh new writer. That's amazing. I love it. And yes, poetry can be expensive hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is the book also published in Vietnamese? So um, there have been publishers who approached me with the interest to, uh, to have this published in Vietnamese. Um, but I, uh, when we sold the rights, my publisher wanted international rights. But I, th I said I wanted to keep the Vietnamese rights because I want to translate it myself. Even though I had written The Mountain Sing with, you know, with, with the um, um, consciousness to protect the vietnamese of, of the Vietnamese setting, you know, the authenticity of the Vietnamese setting and the, the, the people speak and behave like Vietnamese. But I feel I should be translating it by myself because maybe I want to rewrite some part, you know, I don't know. Because the, I also work as a translator and, no, and when I translate my work, I feel... I can open some smaller secret doors <laughs> into the language, um, which I have the freedom to do if I'm an, the author. So, so I look forward to translating this book when I have time. And um, I want my parents to read it because they can't read it yet because they don't know English. Uh, and my, I want my relatives, you know, the older people in the villages to read it as well. So yeah, so this is one of my next projects i think thank you for the question um let's just continue with the writing like people are very intrigued about your writing process i think so um how um how do you capture your creative thoughts and get them down on paper do you have a, a writing ritual that you mm. you do mm. that's a great question to be a writer uh, the first one of the first thing is like you need to be very disciplined uh, in one of the interviews i said that uh, i used to get up at 4 a.m to go and catch you know little shrimp uh, and you know nowadays as a writer i get up very early to catch the earliest words of the day uh, and you know um, normally when i work on a on a novel um i when i get up i don't check my phone don't check the internet. I wanted my mind to be pure. So then I can, you know, because once you read the news, you may be disturbed, right? And you may be worried and your, your, your mind is not totally focused. So that's why uh, when I work on a novel or, or, or when I edit a novel, normally I get up very early and be disciplined not to check the news until I've done, you know, more than an hour. And, um, and also, um, so routines, um, I, I read a lot. One of the best thing of being a writer is reading and calling it a part of your job. <laughs> so, you know, reading, um, you know, provides me so much in, uh, motivation. So whenever I read a good book, I'm like, wow, this person can do it like that. Maybe I can do it too. I don't have to write the same, but they have, Look how easy they have employed the words. I can do it the same way. So, so you know, reading is such an important part 
of learning as a writer and I read widely non-fiction, fiction, history, you know, I feel like I need to learn so much as a writer. Today I was um, rereading Afterlife by Julia Alvarez and this is one of the, the new books, new novel, which I really, really love. And Julia uh, radiates her knowledge and her insights in this book, her knowledge about, you know, world events uh, from climate change to, um, you know, um, to immigration, and to, to, you know, her understanding of politics in, in America. So she brings everything together inside this book, Afterlife. And when, and when I read, I'm really fascinated because, you know, I think a, a writer has to show what he or she knows right? Um, you know, either poetry or fiction or nonfiction. So that's why, you know, I'm really excited to learn from other writers and to read. Um, another, another tip about writing for me is to keep the mind calm. Uh, so, you know, one of the routine for me as a writer is to practice calmness. Um, you know, I must tell you, it's not easy to become a writer. You, you, because the world is so noisy out there, you can get criticized for something that you just said. For example, I just give you an example, right? Recently, I answered an interview and I was interviewed for one hour and 10 minutes. And the journalist, because of the word cow limit, she had to condense you know, the article, the interview to a small section, uh, you know, 700 words. And of course, she only presented a part of my story. And some readers read it and then became furious and criticized me. Um, and at first, I was so shocked. I was called a gook. They, you know, a commenter called me a gook, you know in the comments. I was so upset uh, with a lot of racist comments, but I calmed down and I, I, I accepted that being a writer is about putting yourself out there, you know, and accepting criticism. And in Vietnamese, we say, uh, um, being, being a writer is having thick skin, you know, uh, you need to have thick skin to be able to you know, like to uh, accept people's criticism and also learn from constructive criticism. Because I think being a writer, you know, um, I think nobody is perfect and I have a lot of learning to do, you know. When I read people's feedback about my book, I might realize that there's something I did not cover in the book. I, I, I may not be able to cover in this book, but as I learn from writer's feedback, I may absorb it and then bring it out in the next novel. So it's a continuous, continuous learning process. And, and I'm, I'm just so thankful that I'm able to return to my dream because there's nothing I want more than being a writer. So, you know, I was saying that one of my uh, disciplines about being a writer is to keep the mind calm and, you know, keep the noise out. So one of the things for keeping calm is to read a lot and I meditate. I spend a lot of time in nature. Uh, I love taking walks um, and listening to audio books when walking. And I, I do yoga. Yoga is so important. It keeps me fit, but also it keeps me focused. So, so sometimes I read, you know, I read so much uh, and I, I write. Uh, I spend a lot of time on the computer. So one of the best things to clear my mind is to do a headstand. And I have been practicing handstand, you know, for about six months. But because I'm afraid of height, so, you know, I can do the handstand if somebody helps me to flip up, but I cannot jump up because I'm a bit scared. So I have to overcome my fear. And hopefully when I talk to you next time, I can do handstand in the middle of the room. <laughs> That's my dream. <laughs> Thank you, Kui Mai. That was all great stuff. Um, one last uh, writing kind of question is, do you have any advice for folks who want to get published? How did you get published? Oh, 
the journey to publication is difficult but not possible not impossible i'm the proof because i tried for two and a half years to find an agent and you know and i i think my book is difficult because it deals with a difficult topic and you know it's not a happy book right so the p you know to find an agent who believes in it is difficult and also because i was pitching to american agents and the first scene of the book is the american formula of hanoi in 1972 so you know i was i was hoping an agent would be able to 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 you know to say, uh, an agent would say i want to read the whole book not just the first chapter so but I did not give up. I, um, I tried uh, for two and a half years. And then luckily I met Viet Thanh Nguyen. And then, you know, uh, we exchanged, uh, you know, we exchanged books. And because he's so wonderful that one day I, I thought, what do I have to, uh, to, to lose? I, I emailed him a one page synopsis of the novel. And he said, oh, wow, this sounds wonderful. I'm going to introduce you to my agent. So my advice is, to work really hard on a project that you believe in. And, you know, I used to be a documentary filmmaker and a film producer used to tell me, you can't make a good film unless your hands tremble behind the camera. And I believe this is true. I, you, we cannot write an excellent book if we are not, unless we are passionate about the subject. For me to write The Mountain Sing, I cry so much. I lived the experiences of my characters. I felt their pain. And, you know, I wrote stuff before that, but I throw it away because I know it's not good enough. Unless you feel inside, deep into your, in your gut that it's good, then you should send it out. And my advice is not to publish something which is just okay. Because actually, um, I wrote another novel before this. And I had another agent who sold it, but I thought it's not good enough. So I said, no, I don't want to publish it yet. So she was so furious with me. So we ended the contract. But imagine if I published that book, my career would be down the drain because I have heard stories from writers that your first record, your, the first book that you launch is so important, right? Because once you sell, you, when you want to sell the manuscript, the editors will look at the sales record of your first book. So patience is so important. You know, I worked seven years on the book and sometimes I felt like, oh, I'm so sick of this. I want it to be out there. But I knew it wasn't good enough. So patience and resilience and like just keep working on it every day and build your connection. Build your connection. You, you never know uh, a writer whom you met today is going to help you tomorrow, tomorrow. So be kind and be helpful and be supportive. One of the best things on my road of publication is that I have had wonderful help from amazing um, authors like Bia Thanh Nguyen, Ocean Vuong, T. Bui, Thanh Ha Lai, so many, so many amazing people. And I really feel there's, there's a lot of jealousy in the publishing world, but so much kindness. And I think a part, you know, for me, I believe that a writer needs to support other writers. And e even if you are trying to become a writer, show support to other writers, show the show your love to the books that, that, that you are reading, you know? And uh, it's, yeah, and um, there's, there's so much to, to do, um, but I, the, if you have the chance to become a writer, go for it. And I really, really wish you the best of luck. <laughs> well, my, that is really great advice. Um... And if you didn't meet, you want to hear it again, be kind, helpful, and supportive. Let's be that yeah. helpful. Um, Kwe Mai, thank you. I would, we would love to hear, we'll come back to some questions, um, not about writing, but a little more heavier in content, but let's, let's turn to some poetry. And mm -hmm. I want to let you all know that, let's see how I can do this. I am going to, 
do that, that, and can you all see that? This is a cover of Quay Mai's book, uh, her poetry, and it is available through Hoopla. There's a link there, and again, it will be in the doc that I send you, or you can pick up that link. Quay Mai, would you like to read us some poems? A poem yes. or whatever you'd like. So I, I couldn't have uh, written this book with, without being a poet first. <laughs> I just want to tell you that I cheated. <laughs> I sneak poetry into this novel because it's hard to get people to read poetry nowadays, right? So, you know, when I worked on the edit things, I thought, oh, let's turn this into poetry. So you have been reading a lot of poetry or you will read a lot of poetry through the mountain scene. So, um, so I, you know, I should be holding the cover of the Secret of Heart Sand, but because I was evacuated due to the pandemic, I didn't bring that book along. So I'm going to read from my computer. And today, you know, I'm really homesick and I miss my mom. So may I read a poem about my mom? Please? Yes, please. So um, I'm, I want to read in both Vietnamese and English, uh, you know. Um, so Yes, please. So, so I've written this first in, actually I wrote this first in English and then I translated it into Vietnamese. So let me read it to you in English first so you get the idea of the poem and then I read it in Vietnamese. My mother's rise. Through the eyes of my childhood, I watched my mother who labored in a kitchen built from straw and mud. She lifted a pair of chopsticks and twirled sunlight into a pot of boiling rice. The perfume of a new harvest soaked her worn shirt as she bent and fed rice drawers to the hungry flames. I wanted to come and help, but the child in me pulled myself into a dark corner where I could watch my mother's face teach beauty how to glow in hardship and how to sing the rice to cook with her sun baked hands. That day in our kitchen, I saw how perfection was arranged by soot blackened pans and pots and by the bent back of my mother. So thin, she would disappear if I wept or cried out. So let me read uh, the poem in, in Vietnamese. So, you know, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about my mom. Um, my mom was both a farmer and a teacher. And um, she, she grew up without her, her parents, you know. Um, so her mother had died because of childbirth and her father died because of the land reform. So, um, sh but you know, like her, her childhood was filled with difficulties and she managed, both of my parents didn't go to university. And their biggest dream was for their kids to go to university. And you know, unlike most parents at that time, who wanted to make sure that their daughter, you know, would find a husband and didn't need to study. My parents placed importance on my education. They, they make, made sure that I, I kept going to school. And um, yeah, so my mom is just my inspiration. And some of the strong, you know, the, the character of Hung's mother in, in the novel is, uh, uh, is, is, is fiction. But actually, um, Hung's mother has a lot of character, you know, like Grandma Ziu Lan and Hung's mother being strong and resilient and being positive. These are the characteristics of my mom. Sorry, my computer froze on me. So I, let me try and, and go back to, uh, to that poem in Vietnamese later because I don't know. Sorry. So I will read 
I will um, I, I will read that poem in Vietnamese uh, later on when the computer has obeyed me. <laughs> so you can ask me the next question. <laughs> okay, we're gonna we'll do that. We will go on to some other questions. I am going to stop sharing. All right. So let's see. We all. I think we can all share that we just are loving your energy and passion, Kwe Mai, and your love of books. Um, do you have any comments on the place of women in the Viet in Vietnam Vietnamese culture? Oh, I was talking to my daughter today, and she asked me, "Is it easy to become a manager in in Vietnam? You know, manager of a company?" And I felt like I felt like Vietnamese women have done quite well compared to to you know women in other countries. We we are not really oppressed, uh, but we have uh, we have different obstacles. For example, in the Vietnamese family, women are supposed to um, to do all the housework, to take care of the kids, to be responsible for the kids, and to be still successful in their career, right? And Vietnamese men are not uh, supposed to share the housework. <laughs> Let me tell you this story. My, my, my own father complained to me because my eldest brother was too helpful with his wife's housework, you know, with, with the housework uh, of, of his family. And he, every day, my my eldest brother is a very loving man, so he loves to um, pick up the, the kids, you know, from school. And he also goes shopping and he cooks and he cleans the floor. And my, my father, one day, he told me, daughter, you have to tell your eldest brother, he should not uh, he should not uh, be under the wife's skirt. <laughs> So that's, that's the Vietnamese saying for, for men who are af afraid of their wives or who are too obedient. And, and I said, I love the fact that he's helpful, you know, in this, in this, uh, in these days, you know, men and women should be equal. We should be sharing the house, the household responsibilities. But my father said, no, there are, do, there are things for women to do and there are things for men to do. Men should be, you know, doing bigger things like uh, investing or making a good career or, you know. So my father uh, belongs to the older generation. So I had to talk to him a great deal, you know, to change him. Uh, so that's, that's the perceptions of the general Vietnamese public. You know, women are supposed um, are, are supposed to burden all the tasks. And I will quote another Vietnamese proverb: "Con hư tại mẹ, cháu hư tại bà." So, so that says the children are spoiled or are doing badly because of the mother's fault and because of the grandmother's fault. <laughs> So this is a proverb, you know. Um, so women are to blame, you know, for the things that go that go wrong inside the uh, family. So we are responsible for running the household. And Vietnamese women are supposed to manage uh, money matters as well, you know. So the men normally, you know, give the salaries to the wives. <laughs> So the wives should manage it as well. So, but um, regardless of that fact, Vietnamese women have done really well. Um, you know, Vietnam has a long history of women who are strong, who have, uh, you know, for example, the history of um, Hai Ba Chung, the Chung sisters, who fought against the Chinese invaders and who became the first queens of Vietnam. And so if you, if you go to Vietnam today, you will see the street called Hai Ba Chung, the, the two queen sisters. And also, you know, in, in, in literature, there's, there are really famous figures like um, Ba Chu Nom Ho Xuân Hương. She's one of the first uh, Vietnamese women who wrote about taboo subjects. <laughs> she wrote about sex, she wrote about, you know, women's rights, and she was like, it was 
that time when we were still having emperors, you know, when Vietnam was a very conservative, conservative con uh, country and people were really shocked. Here was a woman writing about women's rights and freedom of speech and about sex as well. So yeah, so so I told my daughter, it's it's really it's um Vietnam in Vietnam if you try hard and if you yeah it's it's possible to make a great career as a woman and uh, and have a family as well. And um, it's not as easy as as men. And Vietnamese men normally there's a there's a drinking culture as well, <laughs> so uh, you know for women we don't have to drink we don't have to go to karaoke. So for example, if you do business in Vietnam, the the, the culture is so diff different. It's like in, in Japan, you know, if you want to build business good business relationships nowadays, will go and play golf or they go karaoke or they go and drink a lot and. You know, luckily as women, we are not expected to go drinking or go go karaoke and uh, yeah. So so yeah. So two genders face different kind of challenges and expectations. Thank you, Kwe Mai. I think that the um the it's universal that women are. It's all women's fault. <laughs> it's a universal <laughs> subject. <laughs> Yeah, but actually, I, I want to tell you another story, you know, like um, I have founded a charity group in Vietnam to help kids with cancer. So because of Agent Orange, a lot of young kids in Vietnam inherit, you know, these faulty genes from their grandfathers and they have all types of cancer and the rate of childhood cancer is very, very high in Vietnam. And one of the mothers told me that when her child got cancer, the neighbor stopped speaking to her. She's a, from a small village in the rural area. And, the, uh, and the, um, the neighbors blamed her that the child got sick. And they said because she did something bad in her past life. So it's her karma that she's getting. So they, they you know, they, they really uh, gave her a hard time. And it's, it's heartbreaking. It's terrible. What's the name of your nonprofit? Oh, um, yeah. Chắp cánh ước mơ, chắp cánh ước mơ, uh, giving wings to dreams. Oh. So, you know, these kids, um, they have, when I talked, to, you know, I founded this as um, out of the blue, you know, like, because um, when I was in Hanoi one, one Christmas, I went to a hospital and I started to give Christmas gifts and I saw these kids with cancer who were looking so afraid. You know, like the hospitals in Vietnam are so crowded, you can imagine that a small single bed um, can have two or three kids lying on them. And these kids, they see, you know, children dying around them and they were very afraid and I wanted, and I asked them what they, they wanted, you know, to, to have and they said, oh, you know, we wanted to see, to have books, here so we could read or we could we wanted to see you know colorful pictures in on the wall so i dis, i decided to set up you know libraries inside the hospitals we, I, I i talked with the art students and we painted the whole <laughs> you know every room and we we had the music therapy so we i asked donors to buy you know like uh, ipods for us and then we did film showing and these kids told me they wanted to have birthdays and a lot of them had never had birthday in their lives because you know birthdays are not normally cele celebrated in vietnam traditionally we we celebrate death days the days that people died and you know you remember that day and then you make an offering for next year but for birthdays traditionally it's not celebrated and these kids they wanted to have that so you know what i did i went to the five star hotels in hanoi and i said i have this 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 group all volunteers nobody got paid i want to do a monthly birthday party would you donate your cake and I founded this group like more than 10 years ago and now still these five-star hotels every month, <laughs> they, they give us the best cakes. And I'm just, I just want to tell you that these kids, when they ha have the birthday parties, 
they're just just so so happy and you know and our group do not uh, accept donations directly i want people to go to the hospital and give the gifts so every month like our um our um, volunteers they write down the kit with birthday uh, birthdays so they send it to the donors so the donors go you know they can be the moms or the dads they go to the market and buy and wrap wrap these gifts and give it to the kids themselves and that's such a meaningful thing and i want to return to the the my message of kindness you know earlier there is so much that we can do to spread kindness and i mean now with the covid situation you know i think we can only overcome this if we are more kind to each other and and my book even though it's about the horror of war but it highlights the value of kindness and and i just i just desperately want people to love each other more and be more kind to each other powerful words Kwe Mai. it's so true um so we're, we're kind of wrapping up on our hour but uh, uh, just a couple more questions. Um, can you comment on how your book has been received by the Vietnamese community in the US? And do you think the reception will be the same when it is published in the Vietnamese language? Um, I am so encouraged by uh, the wonderful wonderful feedback I have received from second generation Vietnamese American. You know, um, I can see in this, in this group, a comment from Michael, who, who read my book, and I, I was so excited to see his, you know, Twitter account, because he has been organizing to bring, um, to bring students from the US to Vietnam. And then I read his research paper about his, emotions of, 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 you know, having been in Vietnam uh, because, you know, a lot of um, Vietnamese Americans have not been to Vietnam or have not, you know, the older generation have not returned. And with this book, I just want everybody to return because Vietnam as a country is different, different than a political regime, right? And being back in Vietnam, you can, you can connect with your family history, you can find out more about yourself. Um, and you know, there's so much good food to enjoy. And it's a wonderful travel destination. You know, Vietnam is one of the most popular tourist destinations in recent years. And you know, I, I, and I'm just be, I'm just warmed by reception of, of uh, you know, of Vietnamese, um, the second generation Vietnamese from different countries in Germany, in, in Europe, in France, who have read the books in the US, you know, and I'm so honored to be championed by, you know, like amazing Vietnamese American writers like Ocean Buong. He's just incredible and he champions this book and such a big honor for me and, and, and other Vietnamese American writers. So um, for the older generation, it's a bit difficult. They, they read, for example, I had an interview with um, Voice of Vietnam in Vietnamese language. And, uh, and you know, like the, the comments there were really like, if I, if I took these comments personally, I would be this depressed. Um, I would not be able to write anymore because they are very hurtful. But, but I believe that um, the people who commented have not read my books. And, uh, and, um, and with this book, I am uh, addressing difficult issues which existed in our history for so, for so many years. You know, the, the issues of reconciliation, of forgiveness, of, um, of seeing others' experiences through somebody else's eyes. So, you know, like, I think with any war, the tendency is to dehumanize the other side. And, you know, and with this book, I want to humanize all sides so that we can see, you know, into the other people's experiences through, through, their, through their stories. So this is a, a difficult, difficult process. So, so I don't know yet because I cannot speak for, for so many Vietnamese people. 
I, I just, you know, this is a work of fiction, right? Uh, not everything here is true. Of course, it's inspired by real experiences. But, um, you know, it is, it's, a, it's a book, if it provokes people's reaction, I think it's wonderful. Whether it's positive or negative, it makes people to care about the topic. It makes people to care more about Vietnam. It makes people want to talk about issues that we need to resolve within our community, and that's important. Thank you, Kui Mai. That was very beautiful. Um, I just want to shout out some of the comments that people have been saying. I don't know if you've been reading them, but everybody loves the work. They love your lyrical tone. They love, uh, let's see here, beautiful writer, beautiful person, and soul inside and out. Fabulous story. Um, we are a lot of us did the audiobook and we just loved the narrator and thought that the flow and the beauty really came through in that as well. Um, let's see. I see somebody put in the Divan uh, link. That's a really great writer's um, resource, and I'll put that, I'll add that to the list as well. Thank you. Um, let's see. Beautiful story. I, a restingly beautiful writer, but a beautiful person. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, anything else that I want to shout out? Is there any, I mean, I know there were other questions, but, um, and Kwema, you did uh, mention several other writers, but do you have any last recommended reads that we should be, we love that you're a reader, you should, you should just become a librarian. We love you. <laughs> we'll make you an honorary, honorary library person. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I'm like, um, oh, I can recommend, you know, for, for literature about Vietnam. Yeah. Um, I want to recommend, you know, if you're interested about, you know, the, the experiences of, you know, in English, you can read Zung Tu Hương, Paradise of the Blind. It's a wonderful book. And I hope your library has it, um, Paradise of the Blind by Zung Tu Hương, or, you know, The Sorrow of War by Bao Ning. And there are so many books that I love which have not been translated into, uh, into English. Um, but, you know, in terms of uh, Vietnamese American writers, uh, you have so many fantastic writers like Ocean Vuong, um, Ocean Vuong, On Earth We're Gorgeous, uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen, the sympathizer, is so amazing. And his next, uh, the sequel to the sympathizer, the committed, is coming out soon. So I'm reordering it. Um, T Boy, the best we could do a graphic memoir or graphic novel is fantastic. Um, Lai Thanh Ha, Inside Out and Back Again, which is like, um, it's, it's Poetry, you know, she writes the whole book, uh, you know, is a, um, um, in, in poems, you know. So it's, she's working on a sequel for Inside Out and Back Again. Monique Chung is a wonderful writer. There's so many other writers. And one other writer who, who I really love, if you love the language, is Andrew X. Farm. Andrew X. Farm, you know, wrote this book, A Catfish and Mandala. And... Um, Oh, there's so many, so many wonderful writers. Or uh, when heaven and earth change places, um, it's, it's a wonderful memoir um, by Le Lee Hayslip. But you know, like I've been uh, reading authors from around the world, and I'm loving, um, you know, the girl with the louding voice um, from from an author. I can't remember her surname, but her first name is Abby. Um, I just finished reading this book that changed me. And I, I highly recommend it. So you want to talk about race, uh, you know, it's about racism and the actions we need to take as individual and as a community to, to counter racism. And I think it's so important that, that we work together on this because I've seen so much racism. I've heard so many stories of racism now with the COVID situation. Oh, that just there's just so many wonderful stories that so many wonderful new books this year. I'm so excited. My my list of you know reading is so so long, but I'm really happy to be able to read. Thank you.
Thank you, Kwe Mai. And I think I, I caught most of the books that you just um, listed off and I'll add those to the um, document and link them for you. Hopefully we have them in our collection. If not, I will attempt to get them in our collection. Um, and yeah, we are all working in e-format, but definitely support our local bookstores here in town and they will ship to your house or do curbside. So please do that. And you know, um, I just wanted to give a shout out to um, Li Bui. She was one of our One City, One Book, which is a, a big, big campaign. So her graphic novel was read by all of the Bay Area pretty much. And everyone in the Bay Area loves her. She's just amazing. She's an amazing human too. So. And, and I want to highlight that you should save up some money because she has two excellent books coming out. She's uh, doing um, graphic memoir on climate change. So she went to Vietnam and she interviewed Vietnamese women in Vietnam who are count, you know, doing many things to counter climate change. And she's also um, um, doing, but her forthcoming project is about, you know, like uh, the uh, in immigration, you know, like how, how the people have been sent, you know, like refugees have been sent home by the Trump administration. And so she's fighting for their rights against, you know, eyes and all that. So her work is so, so important. And so you should read T. Boy if you haven't read her. She's an amazing person. Yeah, I cannot say highly enough about her work. We agree too. We love her very much in, in San Francisco. I mean, obviously she's a, she's a Bay Area person and we just love her so much. Um, Kwe Mai, thank you so much. You are amazing and we appreciate everything and you being here. You are so passionate and we, we just love, I, I love you today. You are wonderful. I am gonna unmute. Does anybody want to give a shout out? There are lots of people have shouted out in the chats. Um, if you can check that out, Kwe Mai, you'll see how much love you're getting right now. But if anybody wants to be unmuted, please go right ahead and unmute yourself and quick shout out. We're trying not to go past oh, 11. Mr. Kirk, this was, I was so, I just found this this morning. I missed the beginning, but I just absolutely loved this. And I, you know, I was in between two tsunamis in 2013. I was gone for five and a half weeks there. And it was just unbelievable. The spirit of the people, they don't wait around for government handouts like we do here waiting before they can go. It's just superb. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you for joining us. I know, and I hope I get added to the list because I was taking notes right here, but it was just, your spirit is superb. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, and stay safe from the hurricane, uh, hurricane please. Oh, yeah, it, it was just unbelievable. We, we were just able to get in right after one started, then we left just before another one started. But the spirit of the people, and we went to university, and I remember I was having problems with my brand new apple and so here i am i go in and find somebody because basic it's samsung in vietnam and i they give me a ride on a motor scooter to this little place and oh then i found a museum and i was in the library and they only had one book and nothing from from america since 20 I mean, the year 2000 how this and i thought gee if i had only knows i would have put some books in my bookcase i mean you in my luggage and just bring them over and get live and leave them with the library because it's so hard you know through regular genes and the business librarian her husband was connected with stanford university and they still had a hard time getting books it's unbelievable so of course this is so much thank you so much yeah. Thank you so much. So um, before we leave, may I read you, uh, you know, the, the poem that I promised you? Yes. I found it. So um, this is in Vietnamese language, so it gives you a chance to appreciate our language. And I want to dedicate it to my Vietnamese brothers and sisters who are here in, um, you know, in this group. Okay, so here it goes. Giang bếp của mẹ. Qua đôi mắt tuổi thơ tôi nhìn mẹ tôi tất cả trong gian bếp được dựng lên bằng dơm và bùn quanh. Mẹ nhấc đũa lên khuấy nắng vào nồi cơm đang sôi. 
và áo mẹ đẫm hương thơm của mùa gặt mới tay mẹ mớm rơm khô cho ngọn lửa đói vập bùng tôi muốn đến cạnh bên và giúp mẹ nhưng đứa trẻ trong tôi kéo tôi chui vào góc bếp tối thẳm từ nơi đó Tôi nhìn gương mặt mẹ dạy cho vẻ đẹp Cách bừng lên trong gian khổ Và cách hát cho cơm sôi Bằng đôi tay dám nắng của người Ngày hôm đó trong gian bếp của tuổi thơ tôi Sự hoàn hảo được sắp đặt Bằng những chiếc nồi đen tuyền bổ hóng Và bởi chiếc lưng khom của mẹ Mỏng manh, chống tránh Sẽ biến mất nếu tôi khóc hay kêu lên Thank you so much for your time and I love every one of you and thank you for staying with me throughout this chat and thank you so much uh, Lisa and Anis. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Memorial Day. Thank you. Thank you. I'll you, Kwemaya. Thank you. And everybody, I'll email you the link to this document. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful Thank Saturday. Pass it down. Uh, Hashtag take. heritage at home. Uh, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.